just want to give a little bit of data to the audience that's going to be presented at ASH. So the first is an update um, of, of omicetaxine in patients with chronic phase and accelerated phase CML um, who had uh, failed um, uh, first and second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Omicetaxine is not an able tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits protein synthesis. It's given by subcutaneous injection twice a day for two weeks in a row and then as a maintenance for one week twice a day every month. In the two-year update, what is being reported at this meeting is that the major cytogenetic response rate in those patients who have failed a second-gen drug with um, uh, omicetaxine is 18%. And the median time to achieve that was a little over three months, and the median duration of that response was a year. There was no major cytogenetic response rate in accelerated phase. Moving on to the experience with panatinib, Pan, um, at this meeting you're going to uh, see presentations, posters, of the response of patients who have failed to satinib to panatinib, um, the, their response to panatinib, and those who had failed nilotinib, then going on the PACE trial and getting panatinib. And the bottom line there is that in both studies, to summarize the data, um, in patients who had failed um, imatinib, desatinib, and nilotinib, all three drugs who went on to panatinib, the major cytogenetic response rate was 46%, and 40% were complete cytogenetic um, remissions, and the duration of that major cytogenetic response was 90% at 12 months. Very early follow-up, but um, that was the data for nilotinib. Um, and for um, uh, desatinib, it was very similar. 44% had a major cytogenetic response, 33% had a complete, um, and um, the uh, duration um, was 90% at 12 months. Finally, and this is going to set the basis of our discussion that's going to come, what is now the two-year follow-up on the PACE trial? That was the phase two study of um, panatinib in patients with CML or pH positive ALL who were intolerant or of desatinib or resistant of uh, desatinib or uh, nilotinib. So this two-year follow-up, I'm going to look specifically at the safety data. 60% of patients in chronic phase remained on study at two years, 60%. Um, of the patients who came off, 20% were due to progression, only 13% were due to adverse events. Most importantly, if you look at what the investigators considered serious adverse events that were cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, or peripheral, the investigators who are presenting this data say that those incidences were 6%, 3%, and 2% at, at, with two years of follow-up and that's very importantly all causes. It gets away from was it due to drug or not due to drug. It's all causes, 6%, 3%, and 2%. And yet we've heard from um, the press releases that there's some concern that the toxicity, cardiovascular toxicity, might be greater than that. What do we tell our audience? What do you do in your practices for that patient who has failed now a second generation TKI? And if you want to throw in a word about how you use transplant, please do. Well, so I'd point out that CML was the disease that transplant was invented for. It remains a highly effective therapy. Our view of how we use omasetaxine is, in fact, when the T315I crops up, when we're out of, when the patient is swollen with effusions and we're not controlling it, uh, the, the paradigm will be, let's use omasetaxine, let's stabilize this disease, and let's go to transplant. You know, omasetaxine is a, is a drug that was a long time ago uh, available in our hands in a clinical trials in AML and other myeloid malignancies. And then there was a minor change of the formulation. Omasetaxine came back. There were two trials, uh, one post two TKIs at 1.5 milligram per meter square sub QBID for 14 days as induction. And then once you're at the CHR, you have it weekly, uh, one week every month. And there was another subset as well, in patients who failed 315i mutation, they were given the drug. You clearly highlighted these trials, 10% TCYR rate in a chronic phase in advanced stage disease, minimal responses. Now, the problem with the drug is, first of all, convenience. It's approved in the US. You need to come to the hospital to get two day, two, two day, uh, in one day two injections for 14 days. In a community setting, that may not be feasible. So definitely, there's the urge to consider new trials for different schedule, maybe five days, like we did with the MDS setting, not having seven days. 
Uh, not 14 days. We clearly have to move such opinion. It's hard to deliver the 14 days. I think they're looking to see whether they can get it dispensed uh, for, from the insurance carrier where the patient can self-administer. Co correct. And then, and then I think more role for the drug in uh, blast phase disease in combination with DKI or in an MDS or AML, but not in chronic phase. Uh, the, uh, the, the PACE trial in chronic phase, 60% major response, 56% complete, is by far, by far better than any other drug. Now, if we put things in perspective, uh, if you fail to TKIs with bozotinib or omastaxine, we have 10% CCI, CCYR rate. And we know in order to improve survival, we need to have CCYR. So you have 10%, so you have 90% failure. Transplant, if you go to transplant, you still have 30% mortality. We talk about patients who had we several don't. years of DKI, <laughs> they are not like a one year of CML getting a transplant. So you have non-negligible uh, rate of toxicity. So if we take ponatinib uh, and we can optimize risk factors like dyslipidemia, smoking, uh, cardiovascular, I think there's, there's on a balance what is safety concern if we can optimize the dose and risk factors, I think it's reasonable. We need this drug for these patients. It does offer great health. Yeah, I mean, to, to perhaps to chime in, I think as you look at, at what, what are the opportunities for each, I mean, omacetaxine I view as, as an active drug, but I very much agree with Mark that, that, that truly the expectations is this going to be a long-term maintenance therapy. I don't think we're there yet. Perhaps it's a different schedule. Perhaps that may change that. But it, clearly it seems much more of a bridge to, to, to something else. Now, with the issue of panadinib, I, I, I'm fully in agreement. I mean, I think we've seen a safety signal that clearly is a concern. But I think for many of us, we're looking at a group of individuals in the indication who really have a difficult problem. I mean, this is not upfront chronic phase CML. These are individuals that have already declared themselves as having more refractory disease. You know, an allotransplant is, I think, to be very honest, probably one of the most intensive medical interventions a patient can undergo. Now, it can be curative, can be a wonderful therapy, but it is truly a, a therapy that even in the best of candidates, we've all had patients in which things have gone terribly wrong for them, whether predictable or not predictable. So I think that for that individual in which you're really looking at a chronic maintenance therapy, you know, that, that lack of ability to, to prescribe panadinib without an IND, which is you know, a hassle many just are not going to pursue, I think is a limitation. I think there should be monitoring. I think there should be restrictions. I think there should be concerns about the cardiovascular risk and efforts made to try to see what is the most effective way to prophylax against those. But, but, but I do think that's a, a very important part of the armamentarium that, that, uh, that, that hopefully will continue to be uh, available in, in some capacity.